Hi guys and welcome to module 2 and the beginning of chapter 6. Just a little bit of a quick recap. If you didn't do as well as you were hoping to on the first exam, no sweat. That is why we have one drop exam for uh, the entire semester. Often a lot of students like to drop their first exam because they weren't expecting the exam to be quite as hard as it actually was in reality. So no worries. If you didn't do well, uh, you can start off basically as a clean slate. The final will replace this exam. If you did do well on this exam, congratulations, you still have that drop in your back pocket. And again, if there were anything that you th feel was unfair in how I graded your exam via the multiple choice or in the extended response, feel free to email me and we can work that out. Now for chapter six, we go over uh, population dynamics and specifically for this lecture today, we'll be getting into demography. So basically, demography refers to the study of changes in human regional and human global populations. And, and basically what we do is we use information on the present to uh, predict future environmental impacts, both in where people are distributed and what their environmental impacts on those areas are going to be. And specifically, when we look up at questions regarding population and uh, demographics, we are looking at things such as population size, population density, population distribution, the sex rate ratio and the age structure of a given population and we're going to break down every one of those and then dive into age structure in detail toward the end of this lecture. Now the first variable we really like to talk about when we look at demography is going to be a population size and recall how when we were talking about population growth rates in chapter 3 we were looking at population ecology and uh, things like the birth rate, the death rate, the immigration rate, and the emigration rate. Remember that we called the birth rate natality and the death rate mortality, but those terms can kind of be used interchangeably. So for a population size, the basic definition is how many people are in that given population. And recall how the PGR, or population growth rate, is a function of the birth rate, B, the death rate, D, the immigration rate, I, and the emigration rate, E. Now because immigration and emigration sound so similar when I'm talking very quickly, I'm going to refer to each of these variables as their letter and not necessarily as the full term itself and I'm just going to ask you to follow along but so when we look at the PGR that is going to be a function of the number of individuals entering into a population either being born into it or coming to that population from other areas so that would be your B being born or I immigrating into that population minus the number of people leaving the population now people can leave a population either by dying or they can physically leave the population by emigrating E to another population. So PGR is going to be B plus I minus D minus E. So your two terms that have that are losing population are going to be your D and your E. Two terms that are increasing your population are going to be your B and your I. If your B is less than your D, meaning your birth rate is less than your death rate, that means that more people are dying in a population than being born into it. Conversely, if you have uh, more people leaving a population than coming into it, your E is greater than your I. If these are all happening together, you have a population that is shrinking. Basically what is going on here is the net number of people leaving that population is greater than the number of people going into that population, and so that population is being gradually reduced in size. Now on the other hand, you can have a birth rate B that is greater than the death rate D, and you can have the number of people entering into a population I greater than the number of people leaving the population E. If that is the case, then that means the total number of people that you have in a population is increasing, meaning that that population is growing. Now, the final uh, alternative is that all of these terms are equal. Birth rate is equal to death rate. I is equal to E. In that case, your population is going to be stagnant. It's not going to be changing at all because the net number of people entering into the population are going to be the same as the number of people leaving the population, meaning the population is growing at a flat line or not at all. Now next we're going to take a look at population density and population density is basically how many people are given are in a given population per unit area. Remember this was something again that we also talked about way back in chapter 3 and again this is going to be the total size of the population how many people are in it divided by the area that that you that that population occupies and so you can have the same number of people in a population and have different population densities. A case in point 
point is that if you have a hundred thousand people in population A and have one hundred thousand people in population B but those populations are over different areas of space then you can have different population densities case in point in uh, population A that's going to be one hundred thousand people over a one hundred square mile county and that's going to lead to a population density of one thousand people per square mile however in the second population population B you have that same 100,000 people in a 10 square mile area that's going to be 10,000 people per square mile and that's going to be far more dense than our first example so here you can see that even though the population can have the same size it can have very different densities depending on the area that that population occupies now in addition to population density we also look at population distribution and this is where where people are distributed in uh, the area that they occupy. Populations are usually not distributed equally. For, uh, for example, people usually tend to congregate in urban areas, urban cities, and as a result within a given geographic area, you'll have a really tight clustering of people with very high densities in uh, city areas and then very low population densities in rural areas. In addition to that, densities are highest in regions with temperate to tropical climates. People like tropical areas and they also typically really like coastlines and then it, conversely to that population densities typically are very low in extreme climates and this kind of makes sense when you think about it conceptually people like areas that are tropical and have really nice climates people hate areas that have very harsh or extreme climates it's just less hospitable and less nice to live in those areas so people like to congregate where it is nice to live in now keep in mind of where people like to uh, live globally because that is going to be a question on your quiz and probably on your exam pay attention there's a reason I have that in bold furthermore we're going to talk briefly about something called the sex ratio and this is really important primarily when the sex ratio gets knocked off balance. Now the sex ratio is typically going to be the number of males in a population compared to the number of females in a population and it should be noted that slightly more men are actually born into a population relative to women and that is nature's way of compensating for the fact that men are more likely to get killed. Uh, guys are pretty dumb, see any other video on YouTube for any prior evidence of that. And so because more men are probably going to be likely to die and not survive to adulthood, nature is compensated by making the, the likelihood of any child to be born male is going to be like 1.06 to every one uh, female born into the population. Now sex ratio has become important typically when there is a policy uh, that a country or government implements that knocks the sex ratio off balance. And a perfect case study in your book is going to be the case study of China. What happened was that around the 1960s and 1970s, China was under some pretty serious environmental impacts. This mostly stemmed from the agricultural sector, and they were worried that eventually uh, China may soon face starvation problems because their population was growing so quickly that it was quickly scheduled to outpace the amount of food in that nation. As a result, the government enacted the One Child Program to reduce population growth and kind of curve that population before they reached the realm of starvation. So they're trying to nip this in the bud before before any catastrophic population starvation actually occurred. And so the one-child policy essentially encouraged uh, people to marry later and it encouraged people to have fewer children, namely one child per household. And it also increased uh, access to contraceptives as well as access to abortion. Now, families who abided by the one-child program received government benefits. Basically, if you agreed to only have one ch uh, child for your entire family, you would have a lot of government benefits and see job promotions and were looked on favorably by the government. Families who did not abide by the one child program who had more than one ch uh, child, those uh, families were subject to fines as well as employment discrimination uh, and in addition social scorn. They weren't uh, they weren't as patri seen as patriotic to China and they were typically shunned by a lot of society. Now in theory this should have worked. If you only have one child per household that would put a serious 
damper on your population growth rate. Pretty soon the death rate would exceed the birth rate and uh, ignoring the immigration and emigration rate for just a second and all else equal that population should begin to decline. However, there was a huge problem that China didn't consider and that was a social bias. Families uh, favor boys or sons more than girls or daughters. Basically, if a family uh, had a son, that was going to be uh, that was going to be more favorable than if that family had a woman. So, as a result of this social bias, uh, many families would abort or kill off to, uh, first children if they were going to be girls, and that highly slanted the sex ratio in favor of boys to girls. So, a lot more men were being born into the population as opposed to women, simply because women were selected against by families abiding by the one-child policy. This uh, led China to its current predicament, where there is a huge sex ratio discrepancy. There are far more men than there are women. This has lowered birth rates because uh, the number of individuals being born into a population is directly a function of the number of women in a population. If there aren't a lot of moms to give birth, there aren't going to be a lot of children coming into that population. And so the population birth rate was lowered far beyond what was originally intended. In addition, there are a lot of single men in China, and this has reduced, this has uh, contributed to a lot of social scorn in young men because they cannot find wives. As a result, uh, female kidnapping has increased, as well as forced brides, and none of this is a good thing, so it's a lot, it's created a lot of social unrest in China. In addition to this, when the population growth rate dips too low, you run into a shrinking labor force. Basically, what's happening is that there are a lot of of, um, a lot of individuals that are now retiring, they're getting too old to work in the labor force, but there aren't enough uh, young people entering into the labor force to compensate, and that could cause economic shrinkage. We're going to look into that just a little bit more when we get into age structure diagrams. These are some of the negative impacts that a country or a government could see if these sex ratios got knocked too far off balance. Now, for the last few slides in this lecture, we'll be diving into age structure diagrams. Now, I'm dedicating a a lot of time into age structure diagrams, so I really need you to know that this is important, and this is going to be something that pops up on both your quiz and your exams. Basically, age structure diagrams describe the relative number of individuals in each age class of a population. In this case, age class is going to be every five years, so zero to five age class, five to ten age class, ten to fifteen, and so on. And what you need to know is that age structure diagrams can be used to predict future trends and growth rates in a given population based on what the structure of the age is in uh, population at present. Now note the colors uh, here are delineating reproductive status. So in the dark in the like darker brown color, those are going to be pre-reproductive age. Those are going to be uh, individuals that are too young to reproduce, i.e. kids. Um, in the lighter orange color, that is going to be individuals of reproductive age, folks that can uh, still produce kids. And then uh, in the yellow, that's going to be post-reproductive age, people who are old and are past uh, the age where they can actually have children. And uh, so when we look at age structure, the first thing that we're going to look at is something called the pyramid or triangular shaped age structure. That's going to be the one on the uh, the bottom left hand corner of your screen. And when you notice this triangle, look at how wide the base is. That means that the number of young individuals of pre-reproductive age are far greater than the number of uh, older or older individuals or the number of people in either post-reproductive age or in reproductive age. What that means is that this is a rapidly increasing population. The number of children being born is far greater than the number of individuals that were previously in that population, and that population is expected to rapidly grow in uh, growth. Examples of populations with this triangular shaped uh, age structure diagram are going to be uh, countries like Nigeria or Africa, which have many, many kids being born in any average household. Issues with this kind of age structure diagram are going to be exactly the same as what we saw in China. There's going to be future problems with resource allocation and things like water and the food supply. There's going to be a rapid explosion of people in this population and there might not be enough food to go around in the near future. Moving forward, we're going to have a age structure diagram such as a tapered off rectangle. This is going to be the age structure diagram in most of Europe as well as Canada. And what you're going to see is that the number of 
young people that uh, those individuals in pre-reproductive age are going to be roughly equal to the number of people in reproductive age, in that, i.e., the number, the width of the rectangles in that darker brown are going to be equal to the width of the rectangles in that orange color. This means that the number of people entering into a population are roughly going to be equal to the number of people leaving the population, and this is a population that is basically static. It's not going to be growing uh, or shrinking. It's going to be pretty stable, and that population or that country is going to be doing pretty well. Notice that it's not a perfect rectangle. It's a tapered off rectangle, and that just means that as an individual gets older and older and older, it is less and less likely that he will survive to the next age, so people begin dying off in that post-reproductive age. Uh, it doesn't, they don't just die off at once, they die off gradually at different ages, maybe 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, and so you get that tapered off rectangle instead of a flat one. The final age structure diagram that we're going to talk about is a wide age structure diagram with tapered ends. So you get the tapered end up top. Basically, again, this is just a uh, increasing probability that a person is going to die before reaching the next age, so the top is tapered off, but the bottom is also tapered off. So the bottom kind of looks like the inverse of the wide uh, triangle diagram. What this means is that the number of old and middle-aged people, the people in post-reproductive age and reproductive age are far greater than the number of young individuals entering the population. This means that the number of children entering the population are going to be less than those already in it, and that population is shrinking. The problems associated with this kind of age structure diagram are going to be those that we saw in China in the later years. Basically what's going to happen is that there are going to be problems with social welfare as well as a declining labor force. The number of young individuals entering into the workforce are going to be less than those leaving the workforce and the economics of that country don't look good. Basically it's going to lead to economic shrinkage as well as uh, in huge issues with social welfare programs. And a great case study of a country that is experiencing this exact age structure diagram is Japan. And for a number of social reasons, Japan is having uh, a very, very hard time getting its reproductive age citizens to actually have children. Now that concludes our lecture on demography, and I can't wait to continue our conversation with the next lecture in population dynamics. I'll see you then.